So, um, so hello and welcome. Um, we have a very exciting panel of experts that we're speaking with today on the lead. And uh, this is uh, actually a chance panel that was born out of the discovery that in two very different parts of the world, the US and in India, in Tamil Nadu, in fact, we have had doctors formulating very similar treatment protocols for COVID patients. And both these teams, without communicating with each other, have individually settled on a steroid called methylprednisolone as a key drug in keeping patients out of the ICU. And uh, this is the reason we are going to talk about collaboration today and why it is so important to share knowledge globally. So let me introduce our experts first. We have a team of doctors from the US. They are with the FLCCC Alliance, which is the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance. And this is a team that has formulated what is called the MATH plus treatment protocol. And we'll, of course, explain that later. The, the doctors themselves will explain that later. Um, so I, we have uh, a Dr. G. Umberto Maduri. is the professor of medicine division of pulmonary Crit critical care and sleep medicine at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Dr. Pierre Corey, medical director, trauma and life support center and critical care service chief. He's also an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Wisconsin's School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Scott Mitchell, associate specialist with the emergency department at the Princess Elizabeth Hospital in the state of Guernsey. And joining us from Delhi is Dr. Giridhar, who is with India's premier All India Institute of Medical Science or AIMS and Dr. Parandaman, who is a professor of medicine at the Kilpak Medical College and Hospital in Chennai. He is also part of the COVID expert panel put together by the state government of Tamil Nadu. And he is the person who has formulated the LAMP and PALM protocols that are yielding tremendous results for the state so far. So um, before we get into the discussion, let's first understand from these doctors uh, what these two protocols mean and what they have in common. So may I request Dr. Maduri to please explain what the MATH Plus protocol actually means. So meth plus M is for methylprednisolone, uh, A is for ascorbic acid or vitamin C, T is for thiamine, and H is for heparin. So what we have in common with your protocol is methylprednisolone and anticoagulation. What is missing is ascorbic acid and thiamine, and also vitamin D and other things that we call as complementary treatment to go with this. The reason for adding those two very important vitamins uh, is that uh, the steroids that we give, as the anti-inflammatory methylprednisolone, works on a receptor called glucocorticoid receptor. And the, the health of that receptor, the function of that receptor, is dependent upon adequate vitamin levels. So when we supplement with vitamins, we make the receptor work better and allow steroids to be much more powerful. So the combination works better than giving methylprednisolone alone. And in critical illness, this level of vitamins rapidly decrease within a few hours. So in essence, there is a strong deficiency, and the deficiency correlates with outcome. So it is very important to supplement vitamins in critical ill patients. So uh, methylprednisolone is now been, uh, is a corticosteroid. Following the recovery trial, uh, now the corticosteroids is not a bad word anymore in the treatment of viral pneumonia like COVID-19. So this is very important. So now there is an acceptance that there is a role for corticosteroids. What I'm happy that your group has done is disregarding the WHO guidelines. The WHO guidelines, I'm not sure who wrote the part related to steroids, but either was inebriated or was a completely incompetent human being. What he had for sure is laziness. He did not review the literature. And, uh, and so uh, I've worked on this for 30 years. So I carefully reviewed the literature uh, and wrote uh, a paper together with other investigators from Europe and United States against the WHO guidelines. In, let me make a summary. 
the inflammation that we see in COVID-19 is qualitatively similar to the one that we see in acute respiratory distress syndrome. So all the cytokines that goes up, all this clotting that we see, all the fibroproliferation going to fibrosis is shared with that, is a, non, is a stereotypical response. In other words, the body reacts that way to a host of insults, nothing different. So what do we know about the RDS? Is that steroids work? There was a question regarding the use of steroids until February of this year, when the Spanish group of Bilar published in Lancet the confirmatory trial in patients require uh, a safe mode of ventilation. So the steroids work for ARDS, the chapter is closed. So we have a disease that has a lot of similarity to ARDS, that has both histological and radiographic findings like the ground glass appearance, that to a pulmonology say in its steroids. So theoretically should respond to steroids. So what the WHO did is state that it did not work in SARS, it did not work in H1N1, it did not work on MERS. And they quoted meta-analysis from 2006, incomplete meta-analysis. And you know, meta-analysis now is becoming an industry. People just put all this data together and then they get results. So unless you know how to put the data in, the results are worthless. But if you, what they did not uh, include in the WHO report are large scale data sets from China. In SARS, 5,200, 300 patients, H1N1, 2,200 patients. And what those large, that's get, uh, large data set did is number one, they make adjustment for condition that can cause confusion, the confounder. So they adjusted for that. And then they look at specific Treatment, what treatment work? Because the corticosteroids, we have a lot, okay? Dosage, duration, timing, etc. And what they found is that of metoprenisolone, 80 milligram for a duration of weeks is the one associated with the best improvement in outcome. They found a 70% reduction in thousands of patients that were studied with SARS and another 50% reduction in patients with H1N1. So they did not report the data from the study. They report data from a smaller study. Then to make this even more convincing, not using steroids, they look at the complications and they report data from two Chinese studies regarding complication. One is that you develop diabetes. They didn't even say hypoglycemia. They said diabetes makes no sense. The other one that report osteonecrosis. Well, when you look at those two papers that apparently they did not do, well, the paper said that when you use the average dose of steroids, there is no complication. Only when you use massive doses of steroids, there are complications. And the reason why they use steroids in the paper that talk about osteonecrosis was not for SARS, was not for the pneumonia, was for stroke. Somehow they have these high doses uh, for stroke. Uh, I'm not sure why, but it was very clear whether it was dose dependent. And then frequently, you have seen that, they report a study on MERS from uh, uh, Dr. Arabi in Saudi Arabia. Beautiful study. The problem is nobody reads it. Okay, so the study said that there is increased a reduction in viral clearance. So that's a broad response. Then when you look at the data reported in, in a table, table four, what does it show? That if you use steroids for greater than seven days, so pay attention to this, if you use steroids for greater than seven days in MERS, there is no impact on viral clearance, none. And there is a 50% reduction in mortality. So somehow all these data were not seen and the WHO make a categorical statement not to use it. In other words, what they say is based on incomplete and faulty review of the literature, not to use an anti-inflammatory treatment that we always use for lung inflammation in people that die from massive inflammation. I think that was a huge, huge mistake that the WHO done. And now we have with the recovery trial, the confirmation. It's not just the recovery trial. There's a study from Italy on metoprenisolone, 80 milligram a day 
and then try to treat it down after eight days based on the reduction in C-reactive proteins that shows a 70% reduction in mortality. There are studies from Spain, data from France, so, and, and of course, some from China, they also show a reduction in a large study from the United States, Henry Ford Hospital, that when you use it early, okay, there is also an improvement in all these parameters. So the literature is coming out little by little, but the best study is the one from the recovery. 2,000 patients received steroids. We've never seen anything like this. So pretty much the taboo placed on using steroids is gone. So now the question is how to do it. Well, I agree with your approach, metoprenizol. Why? Metoprenizol is a fantastic drug. Number one, it is a drug that has a very good binding to the receptor. And once you bind to the receptor, then you have the action. Uh, because it's synthetic, it's not degraded by the body. In other words, there is no problem going inside the cells and do the work. Number two, it is the best drug for penetration in the lung. Okay, so penetrating to the lung and the lung levels, the level in the tissue of the lung are superior to the one in the blood. Okay, so very, very important. Now, how to give metoprenizolone? So uh, we, have, we are submitting now to Lancet, pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic study, looking at dexamethasone, other cortisone, and metoprenizolone in ARDS. So I'm going to summarize you the best way to give a drug. Number one, you need 80 milligram or even 100 to saturate the receptor. If you want immediate action, you need to saturate the receptor. But then if you want to keep the action going on, it's, not, it's better to give it as an infusion, not as bolus Q6 hours. When you give a bolus Q6 hours, you have mountains yeah. and valley, mountains and valley. So in the, when the level is down to the valley, there is no effect. Okay, so if you do an infusion, you keep at the mountain peak all the time. And you guys from India know about the mountains. So you keep at that level. So it uh, uh, may are be what we call are resistant to steroids, like smokers, obese patients, sometimes also diabetics. So when you start steroids, you need to monitor the C-reactive protein level. And if a C-reactive protein level doesn't come down, if your oxygenation does not improve in 72 hours, okay, then if a patient, or if a patient deteriorates, you can double. You can go from 80 to 160. That's safe. That is absolutely safe. What we know from the Italian study that uh, is submitted for publication, is available on metrics, is that the viral clearance is not impacted by, by metoprenizolol. It is safe. The rate of complication are identical to the control group. So except for hyperglycemia at the beginning with the bolus, but hyperglycemia at the beginning is very good because that sugar is essential for the mitochondria to generate the energy that you need to support all the host response in critical illness. So it's not a bad stuff. And when you do an infusion, then the hyperglycemia comes down. There is no spike related to bolus. So that's my, my recommendation.